All right, I feel better now. Wow, thank you, Jesus. Whew. Whew, give me a minute to shift my brain. And um, if you've never been in my meetings before, I do lots of prophetic ministry. And so um, we'll spend more time ministering over people. I just saw those people specifically. Have you guys noticed, uh, those of you that have been a part of the prophetic movement for a very long time, that less and less prophecy happens in prophetic conferences? This is an observation that I've, that's something that I've been observing. There's, you know, Sean Bowles is moving in high level words of knowledge. We love words of knowledge. Um, but you should know your name and your address and all that, right? All right? And, uh, and uh, I love Sean. I'm a part of the Love Coalition with Sean and his wife, Cherie. But he moves in the words of knowledge, it builds faith, and then he brings the prophetic word. But there was a day that prophets prophesied. And they would prophesy. And then I'll tell you what began to happen because I asked a lot of the old school prophets, I asked them. I said, I remember hearing stories of the days that you would prophesy and you would call people out and John Paul Jackson would tell people their dreams and Bobby would walk around telling people their thoughts, Bobby Connor, and they would move in this anointing, Larry Randolph, he would read people's mail and they said this to me, there became an unhealthy culture around prophecy. People thought that the gift was just on us and it wasn't for the people. So the Lord corrected these guys and had them shift. So what we're seeing is Bethel School Supernatural Ministry, we're seeing training and equipping the saints Everybody hears the voice of God, right? You can all prophesy one by one. Now, we're excited about that. Amen? Here's what we're not seeing. The raising up of the equippers. So now what's happening is you can all prophesy one by one that you might learn. We're called to the seven spheres of society, and we're excited about these messages, but less and less people actually feel called to plant churches, to do itinerant stuff, or even an understanding of the fivefold ministry. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 11 says, He gave some to be apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers for the what? Equipping of the saints to do the work of ministry. The word some means some in the Greek, in the Hebrew, in Spanish. Some is some, some is not all. 1 Corinthians 12, 28 and 29 says, God's appointed in the church first apostles, second prophets, third teachers, and then it goes on and on and on. And then it asks a question. Are all prophets, do all speak in tongues, do all work miracles? In the Greek, it is a definite no. The charismatic church, we have a problem with that because we say, everybody can speak in tongues. Amen. Understand the context of 1 Corinthians 12, 28 and 29, and you'll understand it's talking about specialization. It's talking about those, you guys have seen them before, where they travel from church to church, and they have a special gift that is just for healing. That's their grace. Some of you will remember the days where tongues would be released in church. Tongues and interpretation of tongues. Now, people have asked me, how come we don't see that that much anymore? So those of you that were around those days know why. <laughs> right? All of a sudden, the worship team makes a mistake. Now, I'm joking. You'll get my personality here in a minute. And the mistake is maybe the worship gets quiet. Maybe during the transition, they stop. Then all of a sudden, everybody here knows what's happening. You grew up in Pentecostal. Right? And they've been waiting for that one moment. As soon as it gets quiet, I'm burnt out in tongues. And it's always the same person. Right? And then, and then what happens from the other side of the room? You hear, yay! And it's always in the King James, right? Yay! <laughs> Even how... My servant Abraham led my people out of, the, out, of the, out of Egypt, so I will lead you out of Egypt. Sits down two seconds later. I mean my servant Moses, says the Lord. We have a problem if God doesn't know if it's Abraham or Moses, right? Yea, saith the Lord, I know that thou art weary and depressed, for I too am weary and depressed. <sighs> These are actual examples. Right? And so now what happens is somebody starts to, whoo, they get the, their field the bubbles, the, it's starting to bubble up. Right? And then it sounds like this, right? 
Because the worship team, the pastor goes to the front, and the worship drowns them out. <laughs> and there's a reason, and there's a reason, and it's a good one. But there is a gift of tongues and the interpretation of tongues. Many of you here will know Fateen Criscow. I ministered with Fateen in a church in Regina, Saskatchewan, and um, she was standing next to me, and she is intense. And uh, she's just like, and she's praying, and I hear her say, Hay una grita en mi alma. Hay una grita en mi alma. And I'm standing next to her, and I said, Hey, you speak Spanish? She says, No. I said, Well, here's what you're saying. There's a cry in my heart. Anybody know the name of her ministry? That's not what it was called before this. I heard her saying, There's a cry in my heart. She later started a ministry called The Cry. But it was a cry, and she was speaking in tongues. So these are gifts. So what I want you to understand is this. The fivefold ministry are for the equipping of the saints to do the work of the ministry. A part of the equipping is, number one, catartismo, is to align a broken bone. Does that sound fun? So a lot of times, you know, the fivefold ministry gift, teachers, pastors, prophets, etc., they'll stand up and they'll teach a message. Now, if you go to a chiropractor, it hurts for a second, then it feels good. But if your bone is broken and it gets popped in, it hurts. And so if everything that you're hearing is just fluffing your ears, then you're not around fivefold teaching. There should be teaching that challenges us. Amen? You guys remember Jesus? Jesus the prophet. Not Jesus the shepherd, Jesus the prophet. When he was wearing his prophet's mantle. You have a crowd of people. Now, the pastor is getting excited. The pastor says this, right? We have a crowd. This is exciting. <laughs> I pastor a church, so please know my sense of humor, okay? I'm not being critical. The pastor says, please be seated, seated. What we're going to do right now is we're going to pass out um, some greeting cards. I want you to write your name there. Somebody's going to get back to you, check on you, see how you're doing. If you need a water, raise your hand. We want to make you comfortable, feel like family, you know? That's the, that's the role of the pastor. But the crowd's exciting. The evangelist, right? He starts an altar call. If you're here this morning, you don't know Jesus. You just bow your head right now. That's the role of the evangelist. That's what they do. Evangelists struggle a lot of times with the local church. Evangelists that are not healthy, they hate the church, they criticize the church. A healthy evangelist understands their roles to partner with the local church and seeing the harvest saved, but they also understand that the evangelist needs the grace of pastor in their own heart, right? Okay, so the teacher in that moment is like, yes, where's the whiteboard? <laughs> right? In the Greek, this means, right? What does Jesus, in this, you understand, he was all five. The Bible says when he led captivity captive, he gave gifts to men. Gifts there is doma, not charisma. It's a different word. All of you have the charisma gifts, Right? Am I doing all right? You guys are you tracking with me? Tongues, prophecy, healing, and, all, and there's two different views for that. One is resident gifting, and one is transient gifting. If you grew up Pentecostal, then, which I did, you grew up Pentecostal, then you have a gift, right? You get the Holy Ghost, you start speaking in tongues. If you don't speak in tongues, then you didn't get the gift. And then you have basically tongues and one other gift. So in a Pentecostal understanding, if you're walking by a sick person and you don't have the gift of healing, you call the pastor that has the gift of healing or the evangelist, right? The charismatic perspective is transient gifts. You have a resident gift, but John Wimber would say you are the church. If you're walking by a sick person and they're sick, you lay hands on them, the authority of the believer. Are you tracking with me? So you also have the Romans 12, 7 gifts. The Romans 12, 7 gifts are the gifts given by the Father. Leadership, teaching, administration. Are you with me? Take notes, Romans 12, 7. So what has happened is people have taught a message that says, well, we have the Holy Spirit, so we have all the fivefold giftings. Um, yes and no. Yes, if I were to take you right now and pick you up and put you in a remote island with nobody else there, you would have in Christ everything that you have need of to establish, to win the lost, to teach, to train by the Spirit of God. But remember this, 
We are the body of Christ. The Apostle Paul in Romans 12, his whole text is saying, one's the eye. Not everybody's the eye. Not everybody's a prophet. Not everybody's an ear. Right? Then he goes on to talk about the less visible parts. Right? The modest parts. And, and I'm not going to dive into that. But actually, from what I understand, maybe I shouldn't even say it, but I'm going to say it, and then you guys can just study it out later. If you look at the overall context of how the scripture flows, he's saying that the modest parts, the ones that need to be covered up, those, you know the parts I'm talking about, everybody's an adult? Actually, those are the parts that are the fivefold ministry. They're the parts that release toxins, and they're the parts that bring reproduction. Not everybody is those parts but they're the most dishonored parts. So now what's happening is this message, everybody's fivefold. Everybody has everything. And then here's what's happening. Somebody gets up and grabs the mic and goes, I see you like a tree and you smell good, says the Lord. And the level of prophetic is so low level because we're training everybody hears the voice of God, every pro prophesies, but not everybody has the function of a prophet. And so what's happening is those that are actually called to the fivefold function of prophet, now, well, we all do that. Really? You all do that? That's great. You all can do that. What's the difference between the prophet and the person with the gift of prophecy? The person with the gift of prophecy, it's like this. Okay, we're going to lay hands on one another. Let's begin to stir it up. I see something over you. Yes. Now, the prophet doesn't have to stir it up. They have to learn to turn it off. Because according to Ephesians 4.11, the fivefold ministry gifts are dipped in grace. They are the gift. Is that, am I making sense here? What's the point of what I'm saying? Who cares about any of this? The point is that God is wanting, he's, he's been breaking the mentality of, if I want to be used by God, I need to be one of the fivefold ministry. Right? Then we swing to the pendulum and we go, well, we don't even need a fivefold ministry. Everybody's the fivefold. You know what some people think church is? Let's just hang out, sip coffee, wear skinny jeans. <laughs> That's what people think church is. Listen, I'm from Oregon. In Oregon, all the guys wear skinny jeans. I told my congregation, if you ever see me with skinny jeans, it's because I gained some weight. And it's just the ones that fit that morning. <laughs> so the Apostle Paul, when he's addressing the churches, he talks about leadership. He talks about appointing elders and appointing deacons. And what's happening is the church is getting so loosey-goosey about leadership, about structure, about government in the church. And, and, and in a family, do you have a father and a mother? Yes. We need fathers and mothers again. We need genuine apostolic fathers. Many of you, I, I think I probably share this every time I'm here, but my wife and I spoke to us to plan a church. I've never planted a church before. I didn't know how to plan a church before. And during that season, God brought Brent and Sharon in my life, and these guys, they literally one year, they sowed into us. If it wasn't for them sowing financially into us, we would have been hurting really bad. Not only did they financially give, how many of you know a lot of people call themselves fathers and mothers? Okay, now, track with me. If you actually look at Watchman Nee, watch, remember Watchman Nee? Some of you, he's written lots of books. He was persecuted church in China. I think he was actually killed. Watchman Nee had sons that he raised up that he personally funded their ministry. Did you know that? That's very different than the denominational model where I have to pay up. Money goes up. Fathers, money goes down. Come on, people. This is, it shouldn't be that hard to understand. It's that we've been in a religious structure for so long that it even sounds like, oh, no, be careful what you say. What do you mean be careful what I say? It's family. We need fathers and mothers. We need people that are not afraid to speak the truth. We need those that will set bones in the house of God. So because I'm a pastor back home, um, I have a lot of favor in the community. I, I like to pastor my city. 
So I frequent different coffee shops, I go to different restaurants, and I make relationship with the waiters and the waitresses, and they all know what I do for a living, and I, I, I thrive in that community, right? And what I find is once they get comfortable with me, they'll sit down and they'll say, can I talk to you about some stuff? What do I do with the Bible? Is it the Word of God? Is it not the Word of God? Is, is, is you know, God's good, right? All the time, all the time God's good. So what about hell? Because hell, you know, I read this book and Tartarus is actually a garbage heap and I doubt Jesus was warning us about a garbage heap. Yes, it's, it's metaphorical of a garbage heap, but he wouldn't be warning you if he was just talking about a garbage heap. Jesus talks more about money and hell than any other topics in scripture. Now we have a, a, a way of building our churches where we never address hard topics. So what is the fruit from my experience? From my opinion and my experience is the fruit is you have these 20 year olds that are being raised in the church. Every Sunday they hear a Tony Robbins message with a scripture attached to it. You know who Tony Robbins is? They hear a motivational speaker with a scripture attached to it. God bless those leaders if that's what they're called to do. But they're not hearing the deeper things of God. And so they've been in church their whole life, but they don't really understand anything in scripture. But it's like this guy, the calling on this guy. The ability to sit down with them and say, come let us reason together. I have an understanding of the word, and I also have a father's heart. And so blessed are what? The peacekeepers or peacemakers? Peacemakers. You know what's funny? If you uh, Google right now peacemaker, you know it'll come up? Some of you know, a gun. An old peacemaker. I am not uh, trying to talk about violence and hurting people, but a peacemaker is different than a peacekeeper. A peacekeeper says, come on, honey, you know, just, I know they offended you, and just get along, and let's all just get along, and nobody, you know, don't bring up topics that are going to create contention, right? This, this is, don't talk about sin in the church. Okay, that's the peacekeeper. The peacemaker speaks the truth in love. And as they speak the word of the Lord in love, bones get aligned. Mindsets get shifted. And that's what I feel. I really feel in this season that God is raising up the fivefold ministry. There are many of you in this room that have been called by God to be a fivefold pastor, but because of the way your father, your grandfather, your uncle, the pastor that you were uh, raised with was treated, you said no to the call. You said, I'm not a pastor, why not? Because my uncle grew up poor, and people took advantage of him. There's a new breed of pastor. I'm telling you, remember when there, there was ministry hunger? Do you know what I mean by ministry hunger? Everybody wanted to be in the platform. Now there's like anti-ministry hunger. People are like, I don't want that. I don't want to go to church. I want nothing to do with anything church. Now our cultures, I don't know about here in Canada, but in the U.S., they say it's a post-Christian nation. So now we have a whole new group of people to reach. Not the religious, they're still out there, but it's this it's, it's a third world, that's not the right way, it's an unreached people group in our cities. And they're smarter than most of us, I don't mean that in a critical way, I just mean they are. They're smarter than most of us. However, they're thinking the wrong things. Blessed are the peace makers, for they shall be called sons of God. Amen? That wasn't my message at all. So, that was an introduction. I just felt like the Lord spoke to me and said, bless those that are called to the fivefold. And that doesn't mean that you're not, if I didn't pray for you. But those were the people that I saw. There's double honor. The word I have for you guys tonight, I've never preached this before, so just give me a little grace, okay? I, I was walking into my church service. This was when Samuel Robinson was with us. You guys ever hear Sammy preach before? Sammy, if, you don't, if you've never heard Samuel... He blew it up at my church. He was reading mail, and he was, I mean, it was amazing. Um, anyway, Samuel, he, him and I are at the church together, and I walk in, and I hear this word, Rehoboth. Does anybody know what Rehoboth is? I didn't either. Turn to Genesis 26. Turn to Genesis chapter 26. Thank you, Jesus. 
Genesis chapter 26, I'm going to start reading in verse 1. A severe famine now struck the land as happened before in Abraham's time. So Isaac moved to Gerar where Abimelech, king of the Philistines, lived. The Lord appeared to Isaac and said, Do not go down to Egypt, but do as I tell you. Live here as a foreigner in this land, and I'll be with you, and I'll bless you. Let's stop right there. When there's a famine in Scripture, very often you will see that the children of Israel will go somewhere they're not. Do you remember the story of Ruth? There was a famine in the land, right? And then Ruth's uh, mother-in-law and father-in-law, they bring the family out to Moab, where they weren't supposed to go. And then... um, uh, Ruth's mom, Naomi, she names her kids, remember, Mahlon and Chilean. Those are not good names. If you study them out in the Hebrew, it means sick and dying. She names her kids sick and dying. Guess what happens? They died. That's not good. Your world is shaped by your words. We are all living right now the fruit of of the words that we have shaped our world in. I'll let you say all that for a minute, okay? So now, God is speaking to Isaac and saying, Isaac, don't go to Egypt. Now, many of us, we understand Egypt represents the world, and it could be there's a famine in the house of God, you don't feel the manifested presence of the Lord, don't go into the world. Okay, that's good. Most of you, that's not your struggle. However, do you remember when Jesus was resurrected, he told the boys, hey boys, go ye and tarry in Jerusalem for the promise of my father. Guess what they did? Peter goes, I'm going fishing. And the the guys go, all right. It wasn't too hard to talk them into fishing. He wasn't supposed to go fishing. Not that fishing is bad. He was supposed to go and tarry in Jerusalem for the promise of my father. And that's where we get that passage where, remember Jesus says, hey boys, throw the net on the other side. That's a word for some of you here tonight. Some of you have been fishing and you're toiling and you're exhausted. And you're thinking you need a new boat. You're thinking you need to move. But really, all you have to do is shift from this side to that side. It could be one minor shift in your perspective. It could be just a minor shift. And then all of a sudden what happens is the nets, there's too many fish. It breaks the nets open. Then Jesus restores Peter, and then he tells him what? Go and tarry in Jerusalem, like I told you last time. Some of you, whenever there is the pressure of of the famine in the land, my finances, oh no, I'm struggling, what do we do? Well, if you're anything like I used to be, I'm getting better. I'm getting better. Whenever something was happening in the house, the water heater breaks or something, you know what I'd do? I'd start wanting to get a second job. Well, actually, it'd be like a fourth job. Because everyone knows that if you're a pastor, you're also a marriage counselor, right? You're also a life coach. You're also just generally a life counselor, right? You do weddings, you do burials. Oh, and you're supposed to disciple. Oh, and by the way, you're supposed to prepare messages every week. Oh, and by the way, you also have the upkeep of the building. Oh, and did I mention you're also supposed to be raising up teams? I didn't, there's more. I was at a restaurant recently. The guy said, what do you do for a living? I said, I pastor a church. He says, you get paid for that? <laughs> I just laughed, you know. He says, you work what, about one day a week? You know? some, some people think that. But back then what I would do is I'd freak out and I'd start looking at my wife would be, honey, what's wrong? I'm looking up job resumes right now. Baby. Proverbs 3, 5. Trust in the Lord. Lean not what? In your own understanding, and all your ways acknowledge him, and he will direct your path. And so I want to encourage you, if you feel like you're in a famine, don't jump to Egypt. God says this, stay where you are. Boy, that's interesting. There's a famine, you're telling me to stay where I am? Let's keep reading. We'll go to verse, uh, he gives him a promise. God gives a promise to him. And then let's go, Isaac stayed in Gerar. Let's, and then uh, he lies about his wife, which is kind of funny. And then, you know what I heard? Uh, so remember, Abraham, he lies about Sarah, right? Uh, you guys ever hear the ministry, Bishop T.D. Jakes? I love some T.D. Jakes. T.D. Jakes, T.D. Jakes said, he goes, you, every, he goes uh, you know who I want to see when I go to heaven? 
Everybody wants to see Paul. I want to see Peter, you know. Obviously Jesus, but I want to see Sarah. She was looking fine and 90 years old. What does Sarah look like? That's a good point, T.D. Jakes. Um, well, Isaac's wife, Rebecca, was about 60 years old. <laughs> anyway, I'll just leave that there. I look 60, but I'm not. I don't, you know, um, these guys just... Anyway, so move on. Verse 12, Genesis 26 and verse 12. When Isaac planted his crops that year, he harvested a hundred times more grain than he planted for the Lord blessed him. He became a very rich man and his wealth continued to grow. Number one, context. It was a famine. It was a time of famine. Isaac sows seeds and what? In that year, he reaps 100 fold. Some of you still have time. You don't reap a harvest if you don't sow seed. Some of us want to sow seed, but, we're, but we want to reap a harvest, but we're not sowing seed. I'm not pointing at anybody, but some of you are up in 7-Eleven with your scratch-off tickets. If I can sow a little bit, hopefully I can reap a lot. Listen. See how I got quiet in here? That wasn't personal. Because <laughs> I don't know any of you. i never seen you in the 7-Eleven. <laughs> However, because there was such a response... The prophetic in me keeps poking at it. Let's go there. The, the poverty mentality says I want to give very little to reap very much. But see, a spirit of generosity will break the back of poverty. Now, I'm not leading you up to an offering. I don't want nothing from you. But in my own life, when my wife and I have been in seasons where it's difficult and we're struggling, we sow seed. It's a kingdom principle. The kingdom is upside down, inside out. Do you know during the Great Depression, during the Great Depression in the United States of America, there was more millionaires made than every other time? Because not everybody has a poverty mindset. Oh, wait a minute. The houses are pennies on a dollar. Let's buy a lot of them. The market goes back up. They're instantly millionaires. Do you have a kingdom mindset, a kingdom perspective? What is your perspective like? See, God wants to shift our perspective. Deuteronomy chapter 8, 18 says this, and God will give you power to make wealth. Do we believe that? God will give you power. He'll give you the ability to make wealth. Now, when we think about wealth, we often think about me, my, I. But biblically, it's Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Right? Proverbs 13, 22 says what? A good man leaves an inheritance to his children's children. I love our culture. I love revival. I love healing. I love the power of God. In our culture, I would think if there was a word that would define us, it would be now. Now faith is. Revival now. If God's not moving, we move him now. We need to learn from some of our more conservative brothers. These are the guys that have legacy. They buy the land, they buy the building, they establish the universities, right? Because they understand it's not, it's now, but it's also long-term thinking. I want to encourage you, what are you sowing? Maybe you're sitting here and you're feeling convicted because you've been sowing seeds and you don't want to reap. Has anybody ever had a season like that? No, I'm the only one? Okay. I'm the only sinner in the room. Ah, I had a season where I was using the gift on my life not prophecy, but discerning of spirits. And some of you knew me back then. I was the prophetic pit bull. What would happen is you'd let Ivan on him. Right? <laughs> let's say, let's say, we'll have fun here for a minute. Let's say there was somebody that had a problem with the church. Not this church. Let's, let's say, let, it wasn't Brent. He wouldn't let me do that. Let's say somebody had a problem with the church. Right? You know what they would do? Get him, Ivan. I would sit in the meeting, I would discern, and I'd say, excuse me, but the Lord is showing me that your grandfather left you, your father abused you, and now your husband's leaving, you have an issue with men, and that's why you're having this issue with the leadership here. <laughs> Everything you said was true. And then I'd, good boy, Ivan, good boy. <laughs> and then I'd walk away feeling like I did something good. I have stories like that, and I'm not proud of them. I was used as a prophetic pit bull 
with a discerning of spirits gift, there was no love in what I did. I've repented and repented and repented. But you know what? During those seasons, there's a biblical principle. God is not mocked. Whatsoever a man sows, he shall also reap. I thought, Lord, I don't want to sow the hurt that I reaped in people. And the Lord spoke to me, and he said this. Have you not considered my mercy? Well, I'll tell you what, I fell on my knees. I pleaded the mercy of God. Have mercy on me. I've spoken things, and I've had opportunities to repent to many of these people, but they understood what was happening. I was very young, and uh, when you have non-confrontational leaders, it's easy to get the young pit bull to step in there and put the gloves on. And that's what I did. How many of you know that's not the gift of prophecy? That's not the right way to operate. So maybe you're saying, I don't want to sow. I mean, I don't want to reap what I've sowed. Plead mercy. Amen? God will forgive you. All right, let's move on here, okay? Let's move on here. Verse, uh, let's just go verse 16. So Isaac reaped so much blessing that the king kicked him out. That's a lot of blessing. Guess what happens next? It's just like regular life. You get blessed, people get jealous. That's exactly what happens in the scripture. Isaac gets blessed, they get jealous. Have you ever had a testimony that you were afraid to share because you didn't want people to get jealous? Anybody? Happens all the time, don't it? You don't want to share your prosperity testimony. You sowed seeds, you reap the harvest, you're scared to share it because people go, well, whatever. You're always getting brought. Listen, another T.D. Jakesism. Favor ain't fair. And favor's a mindset. When you understand that you stand in the light of his countenance and you're not walking around like a victim, you don't get jealous when somebody gets blessed. You get excited because the same father that blessed them is your father too. And if he did that with you, then he's going to do it with me, and then I get excited. Come on, right? I get excited. It's a good word. Okay, moving on. So verse 17, it gets kicked out. I want you to hear this. So Isaac moved away to the Gerar Valley where he set up their tents and settled down. Say settle down. Some of you need to settle down. Another word for settle down is dwell. I feel that. Some of you, you're in a season of settle down, dwell. It's not that God has forgotten you. It's not that you're supposed to transition and leave. It's settle down. I want you to see what's going to happen here. Settle down because your blessing, your breakthrough is coming. But just settle down. You know, the Lord spoke to me one time. Anybody ever see the movie Anger Management? You sinners. I was No. Um, <laughs> Before I was saved. No, that's not true. I watched the movie. I think I saw it on an airplane. And there's, anyway, <laughs> help me, Lord. Do you remember the part where they're like, Sir, Adam Sandler, he's on the airplane? Remember that? They're like, Sir, calm down. And he thinks he's being very calm. Remember that? I had a dream. In the dream, a prophet from South Africa came up to me and said, Ivan, calm down. <laughs> Three times. Ivan, settle down. Some of you in your spirit, you need to hear, calm down. You don't know what God's about to do. Watch this. Verse 18. He re so Isaac moved away to the Jar Valley where he set up their tents and settled down. He reopened the wells his father had dug, which the Philistines had filled in after Abraham's death. Isaac also restored the names Abraham had given them. That was his inheritance. When we, when we look at digging wells and redigging wells, Abraham was able to dig wells there because it was his land. Are you understanding? So Isaac redug the wells of his father Abraham. I want you to think of it like your inheritance. And many of you have been around for a long time and you've heard the messages of redigging the wells. How many of you heard messages on redigging the wells? That's not where I'm going, okay? I believe in redigging the wells, right? There's inheritance that God wants to give each and every one of us. And, and many of you here, you've been impacted by Kenneth Hagin and the Word of Faith movement. You've been impacted by John Wimber. You've been impacted by Derek Prince. And we can go back to Amy Semple McPherson and Catherine Kuhlman and Oral Roberts and Jack Coe. And, and uh, you know, we can go back of all the people that have influenced us. And as spiritual fathers and mothers, we receive from them by honor and inheritance. 
right? So there's a redigging of the well. So what is it that God has placed in your heart? For me, when I first got saved, I'd look at guys like Brent. I'd look at guys like Bob Jones. I'd look at guys like Paul Cain back then. I'd look at all these prophets. I'd read every single book they read. When I was around them, I'd sit there and I'd watch them. I didn't want a word. Listen to me. I've got a word for some of you in this room. Don't be hungry to get words. Listen, listen, listen. Let me say that a different way. Back, back up. Don't fight for the word. Fight from the word. I'll say it again. Don't fight for the word. Fight from the word. Some people, they want prophetic words so much they collect them like a keychain. And they fight for words. I was that guy until the Lord spoke to me. He said, Ivan, do you want more words from prophets or do you want to become friends with prophets? And I said, God, I want to become friends with prophets because I want to learn how they operate. The Lord brought me to the scripture in 1 Kings where the woman that had a little room for Elijah. Listen to me. Anytime I go to a region, this is a second home to me. When I come here, there's certain people that I want to hug, I want to kiss, I want to, I want to just catch up. How's the family? How are you guys doing? Right? Because you're a safe place. Are you, are you tracking with me? I can come and I can rest. But then there's some places I go to where I want security guards. I'm not that guy. I'm not a superstar. However, some places you want security guards. I remember one place they'd never seen the prophetic before. You start moving in the prophetic. I get down off the stage. There's a line of people. I said, how's it going? Can I help you? <laughs> they said, yes, you prophesied, knock me down, make me laugh. I said, what? <laughs> you mean all of you were up here for a prophetic word? Yes. Oh, I broke my heart. I told, this is what I said to them. Oh, that breaks my heart. They said, oh. I said, really? I just got done ministering. I'm so tired. I gave words to like half the congregation. I was just hoping that you were down here just to say hi to me. Ask me how my wife and kids are doing, you know? Treat me like a person, not like a, like a something you just get out and you don't, you know. I thought, this is terrible. That's a bad culture. That's not a healthy culture. You see, a healthy culture, when the prophetic people come or any gift comes to the church, any one of you comes to church, you're not used, you're honored. And then something happens, not a manipulation way, but something happens, Elijah says to the widow, what? Gehazi, what does she need? I want to serve her. Whenever I come here, she asks nothing of me. She feeds me. She puts me up in a house. I want to help that woman. You know what she says? Ready? You know what she says? It is well with me. That's not, it is well. All is well. Look, I'm good. Me and my kid were good. What do you mean you're good? No, she didn't have a kid. And then Gehazi had to do some research. And he goes, she's barren. And then God released a prophetic word through Elijah. And it brought fruitfulness. So that's just a little key in a culture of honor. Is treating people with honor. Not trying to get something out of them all the time. But actually giving. So during that season, I became friends with prophets. And I, I would know what they liked. And so whenever Bobby Connor was in town, I'd say, Bobby, I got a meat offering for you. He said, what you got, boy? I said, I got you some steaks. He said, well, let's hang out. <laughs> and we'd sit down and he'd have a big steak and I'd ask him questions. How does the gift work in your life? How do you hear the voice of God? Tell me about some experiences. Tell me about the first time I met Bob Jones. And you know what starts to happen is out of those relationships, you begin to receive impartation. Amen? Okay. Let's keep looking here. That was in context to redigging the wells. We'll move on. Verse 19. Isaac's servant also dug in the Gerar Valley and discovered a well of fresh water. And this is exciting. But then the shepherds from Gerar came and claimed the spring. This is our water, they said. And they argued over it with Isaac's herdsmen. So Isaac named the well a sec, which means argument. Let me just paint the picture. We're coming to an end here. It starts off, in time of famine, Isaac sows and he reaps a hundredfold. And guess what happens? He redigs the will. It's, he redigs the well of his father. He claims his inheritance. Good stuff. Then what? He moves on. He keeps going. 
He keeps going and he finds another well. This isn't one of Abraham's wells. This is a new well. And he's digging this well and guess what happens? A sec, which means argument. See, some of you, you're pressing in to go deeper. You're wanting to press into the Lord. You're, not, you're glad with all the moves of God that you served and all the revelation that you have, but you want to go deeper and guess what happens? You step forward with what God's calling you to do and there's nothing but arguments. There's nothing but but contention. And you're saying, God, if you called me to work in this job, why does it suck so much? If you called me to plant this church, why is it so hard and everybody hates me? If you called me to do itinerant ministry, why is no doors opening up? Are Are you tracking with me? Fit your own story in there. God, you've called me, I'm moving forward, but I'm hitting contention. Let's keep looking. Let's go to well of fresh water, but then the shepherds from Gerar came. Verse 21. Isaac's men then dug another well, but again there was a dispute over it, so Isaac named this one Sitna, which means hostility. And this is where many of you are. Please hear my heart. Many of you, you've been contending, you've been believing God, you've, you've encountered revival, you've been moving forward, you hit a well, you were excited about the well, and then there was all this negativity. And so you moved on and you went to the next well. And you're at a point where you just can't handle anymore. I, I, can't, I can't handle another discouragement. You see, hope deferred has made the heart sick. Right? And, I, and please don't give me another prophetic word. I came to the prophetic conference, I know, but I'm kind of have a wall in my heart. I don't really want you to speak a word. I got so many words. If you give me another word about revival coming to Canada, I might smack you. <laughs> Right? Are you tracking with me? How about this one? If you give me another word, if I get one, some of you have been thinking, if I get one more word about financial breakthroughs coming, I might take the money from your book table and run. Because <laughs> we don't want another word. We want the fulfillment of the word. Am I, am I preaching to anybody? I love the words, but I want the fulfillment. And some of you, you haven't stopped. Congratulations, you've been doing well. You're moving forward, but you've been hitting walls. Eric, my wife and I, we planted a church. I love our church. Our church is amazing. But the first few years of church planning, you guys can ask Brett and Sharon, I quit every Monday. (laughs) Every Monday I quit. I gained 50 pounds just church planning. (laughs) Hardest thing ever. Because you're trying to help. Just trying to help people, trying to love people. Did I make mistakes? Absolutely, lots. Does every mistake need to be corrected when you're first starting off? No. And so I'm trying my best to do my best. And contention and strife and another. And then you reconcile that relationship to do what? Have another one go awry. And another one go awry. And you just feel like, you know what, Lord? It'd be best if I quit. I'm not doing you a favor in ministry. I'm hurting your people, and that's the last thing that I want to do. Are you tracking with me? Anybody hear me? Now watch this. I love this. Verse 22. Abandoning that one. (laughs) Some of you need to abandon that one. (laughs) Some of you, you're like, no, I'm not moving here until I get my well. Abandoning that one, Isaac moved on and dug another well. I love the persistence, right? He dug another well. Guys, this is a word for you. Dig another well. This time there was no dispute over it, so Isaac named the place Rehoboth, which means open space, for he said, at last the Lord has created enough space for us to prosper in this land. If you don't give up and you keep on digging... This is the year that you're stepping into. Listen, it's the Rosh Hashanah, the Jewish New Year. I'm not Jewish. I don't follow the Jewish New Years. However, on the first day of Rosh Hashanah, I had an open vision in the airplane of the Lord Jesus. He handed me an apple. And now that's weird, right? Thank you. I'm a weird guy, okay? I'll share some of this tomorrow. I go, Jesus, you just hand me an apple. What's that mean? I can't go to the church and say, Jesus, hand me an apple. They're going to think I'm crazy. And what's the revelation? So he doesn't tell me. It's the glory of God to conceal a matter, the glory of kings to search it out. 
How many of you love the prophetic words where he speaks to you, get all the revelation? That's not what's been happening. He'll say one thing and be search it out. So I start searching it out. Guess what happens on the first day of Rosh Hashanah? They take an apple. They dip it in honey. And it represents not only having a good year, because how many of you know you can have a good year and it can still be a hard year? Sorrow. It's overall good, but there's hard spots. No, a good year dipped in honey is a good and a sweet year. And I, I'm going to share some stuff with you tomorrow. I've been having all these weird encounters everywhere I go. Apple this, apple that. Somebody bought me apple iPods, uh, uh, apple pods for my ears. I'm like, apples everywhere. It's so weird. If you know me, that's not the type of guy I am with my prophetic gift. But I'm like, oh, my God, another apple. And so, anyway, apples. Tomorrow's going to be uh, apples. <laughs> but for some of us, this Rehoboth, I want you to understand if you will continue to press in, the Lord is bringing you to a wide open space. Some of you have been in these places of, you ever been in an elevator and you want to get out? You know what that, the, those elevators reveal to you? I have a fear of, I'm claustrophobic. My armpits stink. Oh, my breath. <laughs> when you're in closed contained spaces, you begin to be very aware of some things that you need to work on. We don't want those. Some of us have been in contained spaces that the Lord has permitted and we've given up. One more well, guys. One more well. Would you believe with me for one more well? The well is called Rehoboth. And it's God has made room for you. God has made room for your gifting. God has made room for the call of, on your life. God has made room for provision. The enemy didn't even resist Rehoboth. When you continue to read, Isaac is so persistent, you would think he would stop at Rehoboth. Isaac, now the king comes, he's blessed. He says, your God has favored you so much, I kicked you out of my land because you prospered. Now I hear you're prospering again, I want to make an oath with you. You know what it says about that well, the last well? It says this, not only did he find a well, but he found running water. What would happen if you just kept going? Here's my word for you. Keep moving. It's been hard. For many of you, it's been hard. It's been tough. Some of you have wanted to give up. Some of you have given up. Here's my word. Don't give up. Your Rehoboth is coming. The open space, the wide place, the place where you can breathe. It's the land that flows with milk and honey. I'm telling you that this is a year where you are stepping into not just the prophetic word, but the fulfillment of the words that God has placed over your life. God is not man that he should lie. And yes, it's been hard. John chapter 15, God spoke to me. This is one of the years I'm carrying, one of the words I'm carrying for this year is this. Your season of pruning is over. I feel that for Winward. I feel that for many of you personally. Pruning is important, but none of us want it. If you've ever seen a tree that wasn't pruned, the fruit doesn't grow very big. When you prune back a tree correctly, an apple tree correctly, what you'll find is the fruit grows back and it's bigger. Some of you have been in pruning seasons. Some of you pastors here, all of a sudden your key leaders transition out. All of a sudden people start to leave. All of a sudden the worship, there's a transition. Some of you, your workplace or your relationships, your best friend moves. You're just trying to figure out what's going on. You've been being pruned back. Stuff is being repositioned for you. Why? In this is my Father glorified. That you bear what? Much fruit. I'm telling you, you guys are stepping into a season of the abundance of fruit. Amen? Would you stand with me? Let's stand together. I got some declarations to make over you. I was asking the Lord some, some questions. I shared this earlier. Your words shape worlds. That's actually a passage in Hebrews. Your word shapes worlds. I want you to take a moment here and take inventory of your words. What are the words that you've been speaking over your life? Because you know what? You're coming into a new season. You're, you know why I'm 100% about this? Because it's happening in my life. It's happening in yours. When I travel, I sit with people. I, when, you, when you travel, you get to see a broad perspective of what God is doing. Just last year, two years ago, three years ago, you sit with people and pastors are like, oh, just, you know, count it all joy, brethren. 
Count on all joy when you place trials and tribulations, you know? Well, not anymore. I sit with people and they go, oh, but I'm coming alive. I feel good. I'm thriving. I feel like finally I'm no longer wearing Saul's armor. I'm telling you, it's happening across the whole global body of Christ. And God's not going to leave you behind. Listen, Rehoboth, 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 Rehoboth. You're stepping into your broad place. You're stepping into your sweet spot. It's time. It's time for honey. You guys had, you've been eating apples, but what about the apple and the honey? Right? You love the apples. That's, thank you, Lord, for your provision. How about, how about Isaac, who was prospered, then prospered some more, then prospered some more? It says that he prospered three times. Do you have grace in your life to believe that? Or have you been speaking words that say, well, I guess I'm just going to be, it's going to be a hard year. I think maybe it's just going to be struggling again this year. What are the words that, you're sh- that you've been shaping your life with? Let's just take a moment and take inventory. Father, right now, we just plead your mercy. Lord, we don't want to reap some of the stuff that we've been speaking over ourselves, over our own lives. Listen, uh, Ben, God is, 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 is moving on you in power. Raise your hand right now. Ben Peters, the Lord is touching you right now. Lord, I thank you for what you're doing. The word over you is restore, 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 restore. God is restoring what the locusts have eaten. I see that the, that the enemy pushed you forward and it was encouraging you to run forward and run faster and run faster and do more and do more and do more. And out of zeal, you just kept running and running and running and running. And now you look back and you find yourself running alone. But I actually see the Lord bringing a company of people around you. I see fathers, I see mothers, I see brothers, and they love you for who you are. Not for your gifting, but for who you are. And I feel like there was a season where where, where it's almost like I saw a cliff and you're about to jump off off the deep end, just because of all that you've been going through in your own life. I feel like the enemy tried to come even with a, like anxiety and nervousness, but I'm telling you right now that it's a, it's a new deep end. It's stepping into the realm of faith. You walk in faith. The gifts of the Spirit on your life. I see God touching you right now, and I see your, your energy levels becoming normal. There's something supernatural that's happening. Actually, there's been, there's been some chemicals that have been off a little bit where you've been extra hyper, and it's not just your personality. It's actually been your adrenals, and the Lord's touching your adrenal glands, and your hormone levers are coming normal. You are a preacher. You are a preacher of revival. You carry it, but you're shifting from John the Baptist is dead, and now Jesus is the one preaching Isaiah 61. And over your life is Isaiah 61. The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me. He's anointed me to preach good news to the poor. And I thank you, the Lord has not forgotten you. And there are relationships that you would say, I screwed that up, that God would say, Nothing is impossible. Watch and see, watch and see, watch and see. So Lord, we just speak right now. Even now I'm speaking the creative word of the Lord that the heart of the king is in the hands of the Lord and he can turn it any which way he chooses. And I thank you that hearts are being turned and that the favor is being restored even today, God, in the name of Jesus. I thank you. What I saw was God put you back into a body like a rib and popped you back in. So I thank you for community and relationship that you're placing him in, in the name of Jesus. And I thank you for what you're doing, Jesus. Whew. Just close your eyes, lift your hands with me for a moment. So Lord, we thank you that every word that we've spoken over ourselves, of our ministries, of our lives, our marriages, our families, we plead mercy. And this day, we declare you're taking us into a broad place. I thank you, Jesus, that we are called to prosper in every area of life. I thank you, God, that no weapon formed against us shall prosper. I thank you that the principality over this city is the Holy Spirit. (laughs) I thank you that nothing is impossible with you. I thank you, Jesus, that that sickness that I've been dealing with, that I've been prayed over and prayed over and prayed over, that maybe it's going to happen today. My miracle is going to take place today. So I thank you for a fresh perspective. God is rebooting the computers in your brain. And some of you, you have a memory of all the failures, the memory of that time you got prayed for, and the other time, and the other time, and the other time. And I just see God is completely erasing those things from you. Uh, Brent, uh, I feel like the Lord's speaking, are going to begin to speak to you. If not, that's okay. But just feel like if you need to come up here, I just felt that. So Lord, I thank you for what you're doing. Just close your eyes for a moment. Listen. I'm telling you, where where did you stop? Was it the contention? Was it the hostility? What well did you stop? 
It's time to get back up, and there's another well to dig. There's another well to dig. It's Rehoboth. There's another well to dig. There's another well to dig. And it's fresh water and it's running water. And John chapter 4 talks about this well. And it's a well of living water where you will never dry, where you will never thirst again. So, Lord, I thank you right now that your church is stepping out of what feels like a wilderness season into the promised land. We thank you, Lord. Staring